Like the last few videos I've done, this video is a direct sequel to a previous one. This time, my previous video on legal euthanasia in Canada, dubbed MAID, or medical assistance in dying. Go back and watch that video before watching this one. I know I say that a lot, but I really mean it this time. There's too much evidence in that video to pack into a TLDR. Last time, I showed you not only the high-profile examples in the Canadian media of people with injuries or illnesses being inappropriately pushed towards euthanasia, but also circumstantial, though not conclusive, evidence that the judges who presided over the lawsuits that eventually made euthanasia legal in Canada may have been heavily biased. See? I can't just prove that in a quick TLDR. You gotta go watch a previous video. The issue has blown up massively here in Canada since I've last spoken about it, becoming enough of a shit show that the rest of the world has begun to take notice. Most of the time, Canada's pretty unassuming, and we like it that way. I've never seen a Prime Minister have so many obvious failures to draw the attention of the international community to our little backwater country this much, between the trucker protests and now euthanasia. And it's actually amazing to see just how incompetent he actually is. One of the reasons it's blown up is because stories just keep coming out of people being inappropriately offered euthanasia. The biggest one recently is of a Canadian Paralympian who lost her legs while serving in the Canadian Army. She needed a stair lift to travel between the floors of her house, and when she complained to the government about not getting one, they offered her euthanasia as a replacement solution. This sort of thing has led to a bunch of funny memes, where the once internationally held in high regard Canadian healthcare has been reduced to a joke. A system where doctors would rather prescribe death than perform the most basic medicine. And hey, I'm not offended. I love me some dark humor. But Jesus Christ, this is a situation that we have to fix. This commercial went viral like a day or two after I published my last euthanasia video. Good timing on that. Check this out. Last breaths are sacred. When I imagine my final days, I see bubbles. I see the ocean. I see music. Even now, as I seek help to end my life, there is still so much beauty. You just have to be brave enough to see it. Oh hey, would you look at that? The first commercial in I don't know how long that only features white people. No diversity at all. And it's all about killing yourself. Yeah, the romanticization of euthanasia happening right now is pretty grotesque. Let me offer you a bit of context though. At the end when it says Simons, that is a Canadian fashion brand. It's well known here, but you don't see it outside of Canada really. You know how sometimes when a cause that is considered an exceptional social good comes up, like Black Lives Matter or the Ukraine war or mask mandates or something like that, you'll see American companies run advertisements showing their support for that cause. They don't actually advertise their products. They just make a 30 second spot that appears to be emotionally powerful or whatever in order to spread awareness of the current thing and slap their logo at the end of it so that you know they believe in what's currently socially acceptable. That's what this commercial is for Canada, but it's for legal euthanasia. The most disgusting part of the story, though, is that after the death of the woman featured in the commercial, it came out that she actually wanted to live. The woman featured in a glamorous pro-euthanasia commercial for a Canadian clothing retailer only opted for assisted suicide after her years-long attempts to secure proper health care failed. She was left without primary care after her family doctor moved away. And so, after her Elders Danilos diagnosis 10 years ago, her treatment had largely consisted of a chaotic and ineffective stream of specialist appointments, none of whom had any background in her condition. I feel like I'm falling through the cracks, so if I'm not able to access healthcare, am I then able to access death care? And that's what led me to look into MAID. It is far easier to let go than keep fighting. The British Columbian healthcare system had been unable to provide her with the care she needed, but they rapidly approved her application for euthanasia. And she's not the only one. The majority of examples I provided last time were of people who didn't actually want to die, but for whom the government was refusing to care for adequately. A recent example is of Les Landry, who directly says that poverty is why he's choosing to die. The two-doctor approval system I described in the previous video, where there's strict rules on what a doctor can approve euthanasia for, seems to have entirely broken down. As Landry provided to the media an email where he directly states that being poor is why he's doing this. And the reply is, yep, all good, let's go. Just a few days ago, a journalist, Alexander Rakin, blew the cover off of why this whole thing is happening in his article for the New Atlantic, No Other Options. He makes the same observation that I did, the stunning number of stories coming out over the past few months showing abuse of the Canadian euthanasia program. He brought it up with one of Canada's most prolific euthanasia providers, Stephanie Green, who claims, alongside other supporters, that the worries are being purposefully blown up by a sensationalist press, that the stories aren't being accurately reported on, and that the safeguards preventing abuse of the system are in place and working. 
working. Raikin claims that the CAMAP, the Canadian Association of Maid Assessors and Providers, which is not a government entity, but rather a pro-euthanasia activist group run by Stephanie Green herself, has sat on evidence showing that people who choose euthanasia do so because they're poor or they have debt or they're getting evicted, and that illness is simply a pretense for a lot of people. KMAP holds online seminars for euthanasia providers to help instruct medical staff in the process. One topic that came up was what should be done about poor people who come to them. When the, the Supreme Court decision came down in 2015 or 2016, and it evidently omitted the need that somebody be at the end of life, my first thought um, as an OT back then was, this could be an extraordinary lever to improve social supports in this country if we can gather the stories of people who would opt to die because the social supports are so poor. Um, I have long hoped to get a funding grant together to try to do that. Um, Althea, you're retired now, maybe you could write it. <laughs> um, but it just, it's just strikes me as the, the, the most obvious pressure point to play. In case you didn't catch that, Kevin Real, a senior medical ethicist at Sunnybrook Hospital in Toronto and the former president of the Canadian Bioethics Society, is speaking about euthanasia as if it's a given that they'll be killing poor people because they're poor, and is hoping to use their deaths in a political manner to massively expand the social welfare state in Canada. In the same meeting, they go over the various cases of people who have been euthanized, and one of the examples is of a 55-year-old woman who identified poverty as the primary reason for her request. Mary is very clear that she wants to live. She does not want to die, but she's suffering terribly and she's been maxing out her credit cards. She has no other options. And she's very clear that as the suffering increases, she will have to access MAID. I, my work with Mary suggests to me that there's not a lot of other extra resource we can offer her that she has not already very carefully and thoughtfully exhausted on her own. Um, so Mary is one example. Raikin goes into other examples in the article of people who have medical problems, but whose main reason to kill themselves is related to money. One person is a 38-year-old trans woman who has her college tuition fully funded, but wanted euthanasia because she lives in a one-room studio apartment and there are creepy guys who also live in the same building. The KMAP recordings show us that despite Justin Trudeau's public exclamation that nobody would be euthanized due to a lack of support, and despite the legal safeguards that are apparently in place to prevent abuse of the system, nobody actually cares. It's happening anyway. And nobody in the KMAP meetings express shock or surprise that this is going on. None of them ask if they should stop or reevaluate what they're doing. None of them even seems to recognize this is a problem. Their only response is one, talking about how to teach euthanasia providers to deal with the moral ramifications of what they're doing, and two, talking about how the rising death count is going to be useful as a political bludgeon. And the program's expanding. Current on-the-table plans are that by March of 2023, euthanasia will be available to people with mental illness. In other words, if you're depressed and want to kill yourself, don't worry about it. Let the government do it instead. The Quebec College of Physicians is suggesting that Parliament expand euthanasia eligibility to minors and even newborns, and there are already reports of parents asking to have the state kill their children. And I don't mean with abortion or something like that. Now, I can see the point here. Sometimes kids are born with conditions that they just won't recover from. But considering how this program is going so far, I don't trust the Canadian government to make a determination between a newborn who will live for three painful months and then inevitably die, and a postpartum mom who just wants her kid dead. In contrast to Stephanie Green's statement that euthanasia in Canada is working fine, another euthanasia provider, Madeline Lee, testified to Parliament that the safeguards to prevent abuse aren't working. I'm a psychiatrist at the Princess Margaret Cancer Centre, an associate professor at the University of Toronto, and a scientist with a research focus on emotional distress and suicide in cancer, and this includes MAID research. I led the development of the MAID program for the University Health Network, served as an expert witness on the LAM case, and I'm currently the scientific lead for CAMAP's MAID curriculum development project. And what I'd like to tell you today is that I have significant concerns about the pace and process of the expanding MAID legislation. I've yet to see a public opinion poll on whether the Canadian populace is in favour of MAID for all forms of life suffering, and in particular for psychosocial or structural vulnerability. It's an important question because I believe the Canadian populace and maybe even the legislators are not aware of who has been qualifying for MAID. I've certainly had cases where I felt compelled to provide MAID against my better clinical judgment.
because the law did not adequately protect. The current legislation leaves too much responsibility in the hands of clinicians, whose application of the eligibility criteria according to their own values can render the legislated safeguards impotent. Also, as was said earlier, this is because incurability can be, can include treatment refusal, an advanced state of decline may not need to be progressive, suffering is determined only subjectively, and reasonably foreseeable is not legally defined at all. The absence of a definition of RFND is crucial in light of C7. As patients with prognoses of several years or who refuse preventive care or who voluntarily stop eating and drinking can be placed on the supposedly palliative track one, where there's no longer even the mandatory safeguard of a 10-day reflection period. The two-doctor requirement seems to be no safeguard at all, considering there are groups like Dying with Dignity Canada who keep a record of euthanasia activists who are also legally empowered to provide the service. One of the examples given during the KMAP meetings is of a man who clearly didn't qualify for euthanasia, who was not even of sound mind enough to make the decision, but who, through Dying with Dignity Canada, was put in touch with Ellen Weeb, that's quite the name, a euthanasia advocate in Vancouver who would do the deed anyway. She got one of her friends to sign off, he flew to Vancouver, and they ended his life. Jocelyn Downey, one of the lawyers that worked on the court case to make euthanasia legal in Canada, has stated during the KMAP recordings that you can just keep asking doctors until you get the two that you require. I would also say we need to remember that disagreement doesn't mean you must stop disagreement amongst colleagues. Um, the law says you must be of the opinion. That is the standard. The standard's not everyone has to agree with you. It is you have to be of the opinion. The standard in the law is that you must exercise reasonable knowledge, care, and skill. The standard in the law is that you can have a reasonable but mistaken belief about something and still not be in trouble with the law. There is no certainty or unanimity required. There is not perfection required. So people can face disagreement from colleagues and staff and co colleagues, sorry, and, and still proceed. The end result of this is that there are many paths available to reach the end and you only need to find one. The system makes it easy to die. And patients know this too. There's a psychiatrist, John Mayer, who testified to Parliament that he's had patients who could actually get better but who have actively chosen to let themselves deteriorate until they are eligible for euthanasia because they know just how permissible the medical system is and how it views people like them. And none of this matters because the legal system isn't actually prosecuting people who violate these tissue paper safeguards. During one of the rare investigations into a euthanasia case, the police admitted that this type of investigation is exceptionally rare, rare enough that there's no records on it. That might point to the fact that things are actually just fine, that true violations are happening exceptionally rarely. However, the Director of Disability Studies at the University of Manitoba, Nancy Hansen, has stated that due to the way the law is written, there is no legal consequence for non-compliance. The people who do the training on how to administer euthanasia, the people who do the assessments on who qualifies, the people who review the system and look into potential abuses of it, and the people who provide the public face, they're all the same people, and they're all multi-decade long pro-euthanasia activists. Listen to Weeb again. The uh, um, wife made formal complaints against me because uh, she felt that uh, uh, he hadn't been assessed correctly. I was cleared of all wrongdoing, but you know, we know that um, angry family members are our greatest risk. <laughs> Does this sound like somebody who is open to criticism of their system? Who takes abuses of the system seriously? Of course not. She's one of the architects, and to her, it's working exactly as intended. The most recent story on this topic is from yesterday, where a booklet aimed towards children was published. Don't worry, this isn't to propagandize kids into killing themselves, but it's still pretty ghoulish. It's a pamphlet made to be child-friendly to explain what euthanasia is and why it's necessary for the young relatives of people who have opted to kill themselves. It's another step on the normalization of this practice, which has been moving ahead full speed, expanding rapidly and constantly, with no regard for the obvious problems that it's causing. Even for someone like me, who thinks that you do ultimately have the right to end your own life, there's a clear problem here. It's one thing if you decide to kill yourself on your own as a personal choice. It's another thing entirely to have a government apparatus built to quickly usher you towards your death the minute your care becomes too costly for the state to afford. And in a public healthcare system, where the state is the payer and or the provider of healthcare, there is an extremely serious responsibility on the state to not simply kill people for bureaucratic efficiency. And in my opinion, that is exactly where Canada is failing right now. Thankfully, due to all this high-profile talk, pushback has begun. 
the cabinet minister in charge of Veterans Affairs Canada flip-flopped a bit, testifying to Parliament that they did indeed inappropriately offer euthanasia, and then later publicly said on Twitter that they didn't. However, investigations have shown that it was one rogue individual within the VAC who did it, and they've been fired. The plans to expand euthanasia in March of 2023 for those with medical illnesses is being challenged in Parliament, though only to the point that the opposition is asking for a delay. It does feel like the tide is slowly turning, though. Canadian public opinion on euthanasia has generally been positive, but only when considered as a last resort. There's no new polls since all the news came out that I can find, but I can't imagine people still being okay with it after learning about what's actually been going on. Of course, there's a few crazies out there who are taking their objections to the extreme, like this guy. So I guess in March, Canada will be expanding MADE to include mental illness. Now, Google vaccine hesitancy as a mental illness. Are you getting it yet? Well, all right. If you Google vaccine hesitancy as a mental illness, you get a bunch of anti-vax pages claiming that it's happening, but no one actually doing that. Also, you find your own tweet. Also, you know that MADE is still ultimately a voluntary program, right? For all of its problems, and there are many, they all require people to sign up for their own volition. And I don't know about you, but I have no intention of ever signing, no matter how bad it gets. We can object to what's actually going on without inventing these doomsday scenarios, all right? The reality is bad enough, we don't need this fiction. And also, I intend to be an obstinate old thorn in everyone's side for as long as I can. In fact, if this is the way our society is going to go, I think you have a moral obligation to. Look back at that Simons commercial. All the propaganda around euthanasia emphasizes how beautiful your death will be. Even that one clip I used in the last video had the nurse saying something like, suicide doesn't have to be dramatic. Like if I had self-directed funding, then I'd be fine, but... But if you weren't, you, just, you can just apply to get a, a assisted... If you want it to end your life, like, you know what I mean? You don't have to do it in some dramatic manner. You can apply for assisted, you know. Now, I'm not advising anyone to do anything. In fact, I'm saying explicitly, don't kill yourself, guys. You know how there's those hyper-masculine Twitter accounts that talk about returning to tradition and how young boys are being medicated because they can't sit still in classrooms because their biology has them hardwired to be throwing a spear through the heart of a leaping antelope or whatever the fuck? A lot of those are pretty cringe, but there's certainly at least a little drop of truth in there. It is, after all, a common male fantasy to die heroically while defending friends or stopping a shooter or covering your partner or something like that. That doesn't mean that these men have suicidal ideations. They're not desperately looking for a way out ASAP. What it does mean is, if I've got to die, you know, that would be a pretty good way to go. I wouldn't be happy that I'm dying, but I would be satisfied if my death meant something. Compare that ethic to Canada's euthanasia scheme. My death is an honorable one that helps the people I care about versus my death is a beautiful one. At least that's what state bureaucrats tell me in order to get me to brush myself aside for their benefit. I don't know about you, but when I hear that nurse saying that it doesn't have to be dramatic. You don't have to do it in some dramatic manner. I actually think to myself, yeah, it does. It has to mean something if I'm going to choose it. I'm not going to peacefully go into the euthanasia pod or whatever. If I'm going to die, it's not going to be for the benefit of the government. And right up until the last second I go, I'm going to be a pain in the neck for everyone. Because fuck every single person who thinks that this shit is acceptable. 